Hey everyone, welcome to the next video in section 9.3. So in this section we're looking at the idea of linearization near critical points and sort of the easy condition for how we know if a system is locally linear. It turns out if we have enough derivatives then it's just locally linear automatically and we can just use that to sort of push through all this analysis and see what we get out of our system. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So the big question we're trying to answer here is when are systems locally linear? I mean you can verify it directly from the definition but the easiest way to do this is when all the functions have at least two continuous derivatives. So I'm gonna write this out in terms of the two function case, but it actually works for any number of functions. So we're trying to look at the system x prime equals f of x, y, and y prime equals g of x, y. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use two variable Taylor series, which is probably not something you've seen before, but the form is gonna kind of make sense once I write it all out, if you think of the Taylor series you have from, you know, calc two. So if I do multivariable Taylor series, what I get is that my function f at x, y, in terms of a nearby point x0, y0, is f of x0, y0, that's the first order term, plus x minus x0, the x derivative at x0, y0, plus y minus y0, f y of x0, y0, plus some eta 1 of x and y. What this should look like is something like f of x is f of x0 plus f prime at x0 times x minus x0 plus f double prime of x star. Right, this is your sort of linear approximation, your first order Taylor series approximation in one variable. If you have two variables, it looks like this because you have both an fx and an fy term to account for. And the a is a different function, a is going to incorporate all the second derivatives into it. And similarly, I get g of x, y equals this, in terms of the same sort of process we just did before. So now what I want to do is I want to assume that I'm at the x0, y0 is a critical point. Well, what does it mean? That means that both of my derivatives vanish, which means this guy is going to be 0, and this guy is going to be 0, because f is x prime and g is y prime. So those guys both vanish, which means if I plug this back in for my f, I am left with x prime equals x minus x0 times fx at x0, y0, plus y minus y0 times fy of x0, y0, plus eta 1 of x, y, and similarly for y. Now this part right here looks a lot like matrix multiplication. So if I stack the new vector, Let's see what happens. It's going to look like matrix multiplication again. So I'm going to stack this into a vector, and I'm going to change this a little bit because I go and make things match on both sides. So this looks like x minus x0, y minus y0 prime. Because x0 and y0 are both numbers, they're both constants, so they just go away when you take derivatives. And this equals what? Well, I can break this up into matrices where I look at fx at x0, y0, fy at x0, y0, gx at x0, y0, and gy, x0, y0, times x minus x0, y minus y0, plus this eta vector, which is if I stack up uh, these two functions here. Now by Taylor series stuff, this eta meets the necessary condition on the g. So right, we had the weird condition where g, g of x over x had to go to 0 as x went to 0. Because we got eta from a Taylor series approximation, it automatically satisfies that. Because this eta 182 go like distance squared, so if you divide by distance, it's still going to go 0, the distance goes to 0. It's not too important to know how it works, but that it does. That in this case, we get this for free. And so what we get out of this is that x minus x naught, y minus y naught prime equals some matrix j times x minus x0, y minus y0 plus some eta of x and y is a locally linear system, where this j is called the Jacobian of our function. And it always has this form, fx, fy, gx, gy, where you evaluate all the functions at x0, y0. So now, this gets us to a constant coefficient matrix that we can use to try to analyze our system. So the ideas before told us that studying properties of j should give us an idea of what the nonlinear system 
looks like near that point, near the critical points. And then we can try to sort of fill things in from there on out if we want. Again, the centers and repeat roots are going to be issues, but you'll generally have to use numericals to figure out the distinction there because there's nothing you can do analytically to figure out what's going to happen when you move things a little bit by a nonlinear factor. And so the main thing you want to look at here is table 9.3.1 in the book, which tells you how you get from the linear system, which is this J, to the nonlinear system just based on being able to go between the different types of equilibrium points. So take a look at that. Um, and that's really it for this video. So the next video is going to be an example of using this to sort of solve a problem with where you want to sketch out what the system looks like, the nonlinear system looks like, using the data from the linearized version. So I'm going to give you a problem to look at here, which is going to be to find the Jacobi matrix, this J, for the system we dealt with um, in the last section. So let me put that up for you right now. Right, so this is the same system you had last time. So I want you to now look at this one, and I want you to find the Jacobi matrix at all the critical points. You should have found the critical points in section 9.2's videos, but now I want you to find the Jacobi matrix for this. And remember, Jacobi matrix is just these partial derivatives, but when you do it at a point, you want to evaluate at those critical points. We'll talk about that a little bit in the next video as well. All right, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.